Hey, I'm Jesse Cowell, aka Jess Kid, creator of like a gazillion things online, and you are listening and watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented individual. This is his first time on the show, but I've known him for almost 10 years now. He is a very talented director, creator, content creator, everything along that line. He is a, a true, wonderful person to finally get on this show. He's, of course, the creator of Just Kids World, Jesse Cowell. How are you doing today, Jesse? I'm doing amazing. I have coffee and I have good company. Well, I can't lose. I can't lose. I can't lose. <laughs> today, I'm batting a thousand until something goes wrong. And then I'm batting like <laughs> 990. And then something. I don't know. <laughs> oh, better than the Tigers either way. Uh, sports analogies aside. <laughs> Nothing I, better than I, starting I, a geek podcast with a sports analogy. That's way, <laughs> way, way to appeal to your audience. I'm just messing with you, please. I'm sorry, 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 sorry. I, I, I digress <laughs> or something. I back off. I step away. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, it's all good. You know, looking at, at your body of work, I've known you for, like I said, for at least 10 years now. Originally through Rooster Teeth, originally through your uh, creation of a lot of your amazing feature films, you know, we'll, we'll talk about your whole career and all that sure. other stuff, but, but how are you doing in this pandemic world these days? Surprisingly, I feel pretty good. I mean, uh, barring, uh, watching the utter collapse of the, um, the, the norms of reason and sanity among my fellow human beings. Uh, I feel pretty good. <laughs> I mean, it's a terrible thing to say. I mean, but uh, my family's healthy, number one, right? Uh, people I know are healthy. I've known a lot of people have lost somebody to this terrible thing. It's been heartbreaking to watch, but as far as like me personally, I'm okay. In fact, in some ways, I feel like I'm stronger than I've ever been, uh, or at least at my strongest. And I think part of that was when the pandemic hit, uh, I'm a guy that, that sort of does a lot of stuff from home. Right. I mean, a filmmaker and I put a lot of video online. So for me, I have three, a three camera setup. Obviously, this is a nice lens and a nice camera with a nice mic. So for me, when the pandemic hit, I had all these tools already so that when people needed to twofold, when people needed things uh, for a university, they didn't understand. Well, like, who knows how to do that? I'm one of those people. And then B, creatively, uh, I found new ways to inspire myself. And I think, think personally, because I've been through so much in the industry. And it's such an awful, horrific, terrible, scar, soul, scar, scarring. I don't know. There were words that meant something there. The uh, experience that I needed time. And I think that it gave me the time to find my own sense of what do I want to do? And do I still have the energy to do it? Turns out I do. Thank God. Because I've been doing this for a long time. I'm a filmmaker of stuff for almost 30 years. And people look at me, oh, you look so young, blah, blah, blah. And that's great. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. But I'm really, I'm, I'm 48 years old. Nothing wrong with that. You know, I got 30 more years left of me. George R. Martin was like 700 years old when he wrote, with respect, I love you, man, when he wrote Game of Thrones. So I feel like uh, there's still a lot to give, but I think I had to discover that. And I think coming out of the pandemic, like, I feel like I'm starting to catch fire again. And it's been a, it's been a while. And those that have known me my friend, career, you fought for 10 years, but probably more. Uh, you don't realize it, right? I started posting videos online in 2003, 1999 or something crazy like that in, in different formats. And I just feel like you're always trying to get back to when you're at your strongest. And then I feel like uh, I'm almost there and I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful again. That's a nice way to come out of like a worldwide disastrous, you know, pol politics gone haywire. Everybody hates each other uh, scenario. I feel like my time is actually coming as opposed to my time has passed. And that's a nice, at least feeling. Who knows if it's true, but as a way to wake up every day and a way to sort of create stuff, that's a great place to be. So, long story short, you, you've had a great resurgence in, in social media and TikTok has been a wonderful avenue for your creativity, especially with the one minute plus sound bites and video bites that you've been providing, not only just from your work from home uh, series that you've created, but the other stuff when you first started on TikTok as well too. But you've been producing for YouTube, you've been producing for a bunch of other things as well too in your lifetime. What is it about at least TikTok for now that keeps you creative? Well, here's the deal. Uh, I'm a very honest 
straightforward person. I, and I, I tell it like I see it. it. doesn't mean it's the truth, but it's sometimes my truth. I change my mind all the time. So if you try to like say, oh, you tell me this thing on a Tuesday, I, Wednesday, I thought something different. And then Thursday, I thought the same thing. Here's why I like TikTok. And here's why I'm invigorated by it. Um, and th this could be any platform, uh, you know, five years from now, it could change. Is It's the first platform in many years where there is a sense of meritocracy. There is a sense that if you create stuff that's above average or really strong or dynamic or interesting, then it, the algorithm itself supports that content moving up. Every other medium, every single one is based upon if you pay me or what's already popular gets fed more popular things or popular people pass the popular baton back and forth. And that is anti-art. That is anti-creation. And it hurts creators who are good and experienced from moving forward. And it discourages them from doing it. TikTok is the first platform. And that's why I'm so excited to make stuff for it. Because, and even though I have to sort of contain it and I have to shape it, but I'm not, and we can talk about formats in a little bit because uh, you know one of my strongest skills is as an editor, at least I hope so. But I feel like TikTok is the first time that I can make something that I know is strong and know it has a chance to be seen. And this, uh, I guess, goes into the story of my life. But I went into this hoping originally as an artist that if you're just good enough, build it, they will come, field of dreams. But if you're just good enough, your stuff will translate. People will find it because that's, that's what people say. And that's the, men, that's the thought out there. It's almost like the thought of like the general idea of capitalism, which I have no problem with capitalism as a concept, but the idea of work hard, you will be rewarded. That's not always the case. Systems are built up to stop you in certain cases. And I, I'm not saying play the victim. You still have to work your ass off and, and, and try to climb within the parameters of what you're doing. What I am saying is, Certain systems are not designed for you to work hard and get rewarded or be good and get rewarded for being good. It's not a sport. You know, it's not like you get up, you hit the ball and they say, oh, you hit a ball, foul ball. ball. It's, a, it's a kind of thing. It's like interpretive figure skating you know what I mean? <laughs> where there's some judge who didn't like, you know, the way your dress was cut. That's the arts. And uh, TikTok, why I feel so empowered by it, A, I've gotten to a good place myself mentally. I feel rested. I feel strong. Uh, I feel good about bringing people together in a community to making stuff. I'm excited to work with people. I'm excited to promote other people. Anytime I see another artist that I think is really good, I will go to their page or whatever and say, oh, you're doing just amazing stuff. I'm so inspired by you because I know what it feels like to be that person and having no one notice how awesome they are. And I'm not just talking about somebody who's just like flash in the pan. I mean, somebody you can tell they're putting in the work and they're, they're making really good stuff and just not enough people are paying attention. So that's like my obligation to do onto others in that moment, because that's what I would want for me, because that's what was not in some cases given to me. Now, I'm not saying given in the sense of, oh, you feel like you deserve, you know, you're, just, you're innately talented. No, I've done the work. And then in telling you what my experience is, you'll see like I've done the work. And in fact, not saying more than anybody because I don't know other people's journeys, but 30 years, highly touted, the next Spielberg, the next this, that, and the amount of like BS and horrible things that have happened along that journey, it's, it's crazy. Now, with that said, my journey has been a story for people. Even back in 2003 and four, when I was doing Jessica TV, it was like one guy trying to live his dream and, and put it into the world and share what that's like to try. And that's what people always admire me back then. Fast forward 17, 16 years later, I'm still on the same fight. And I know I have what it takes because my stuff is good. People can say, well, how do you know your stuff is good? You shouldn't be able to judge that. Oh, fuck you. Me, that person, not you, audience. Anybody's listening to this. Or Kurt. Bless you, Kurt. Not fuck you. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But we like you, Kurt. But my point is, like, how dare you try to devalue what I know I'm good at? You know, I'm not. I'm not I can't fix your car. I'm an idiot. I can't cook you dinner. I'll burn it. It'll be horrible, right? But you want me to make your movie and make it awesome or make a hit TV series or a great feature film that rivals the Mad Maxes of the world? I'm your fucking guy. I believe that at my core. There was a time I didn't because other people were like trying to push it down on me and tell me I'm not this and that. They said, well, don't, you shouldn't know your own, you shouldn't talk about your own worth, right? Nobody else will. Trust me, especially in the arts. And I'm not saying I can't stand people who are like young and they're bragging, I'm the greatest, blah, blah, blah. you haven't done shit. But once you've done it, you better know what you're good at, because if you're wasting your life on something you're not good at, 
then you've made a really bad choice. So you just have to be confident in, in, in your ability to understand audience. And part of the skill set of doing this is making stuff that you as an editor or as a sound designer or whatever, that final step in the process can see through an audience's eyes. So if you don't know it's good, right? Well, then you don't have a feel for the medium that you're in. So I know that what I've created is good. I just, in the past, I don't have a lot of faith in A, an industry that lets people like Harvey Weinstein or Bill Cosby or these people, you know, allegedly, I don't want to get sued, right? Not that anybody's looking at your podcast to me, but who knows, yeah. right? Allegedly, right? That they are allowed to rape people, but allegedly for 30 years. You know what I'm saying? That's, yeah. the, this, that's the industry. That sickness exists. And then it moved to uh, YouTube and all this and that. And the same sort of like people, not saying the rapists, I'm not saying that. I'm saying the same sort of like selfish people moved into that. And then the corporations moved in. And so you get all these people who move forward with no respect for what came before them. I have a tremendous respect for everybody that's preceded me. I have a tremendous respect for those that are great, even if they're not famous. But we live in an industry in a world where fame is the goal. Fame, like not great stuff, fame. And so fame chasers will do anything for fame. And they will always shout out uh, or shout down those that are good because those that are good threaten them. And then when the algorithms themselves support fame chasers over quality goods and the audience is too lazy to dig through to find the quality goods and they just accept everything that's given to them, well, then you have the world of, you know, people like a lot, not all, some are incredible, right? Let's be clear. Some of shows are incredible on YouTube and these other mediums. Sometimes good things do break through, but a lot of stuff that's just kind of mediocre and just talking. You know, 10 things that you can find out about this and click on this and click on that. It's all just a fame engine. Wow. And the, even the idea of influencer, and I've worked for influencer companies. I'm not saying it's a negative term in, in, in some ways, but in some ways it really is. The idea of like, I'm an influencer, but I don't really have anything to offer. So here I am influencing all these people because I have a nice body. What? Like that's ludicrous to me. For me, I'm always trying to find substance, but now when you hear, if anybody's listening to this, you know, you're going to hear like, oh, there's a guy that's very heady and intellectual and he's not really funny because he's just always about substance. No, I think that you can be silly, juvenile or childish, not childish, but Im not immature, fun, right? But at the same time, you can have substance within it, you know, and you can have something like, you know, train, train, planes, trains, and automobiles or 40 old virgin or all of these great comedy pieces that at the heart are human stories about real things and real people hurting and finding comedy to escape it. So for me, I think the internet has failed in some ways. And uh, TikTok is a moment, in some ways, not perfect, because there's problems there too. But there, it's a moment where finally there's an algorithm online. I hope it stays. And I hope it continuously grows in this direction that says, best stuff wins. Best stuff wins. Now, I may not, like, I want to do different formats and that's not in there. And that's why uh, you, uh, Instagram is copying them. And now YouTube shorts, they're all copying them. They have to because the engine itself, see, it benefits everybody, right? They're following them. Who benefits from this? Well, the creator that gets exposure, right? And me or somebody, you or somebody else who out there who's trying to create something. B, the viewer. Because if best stuff wins, that means that their audience gets the best stuff over and over and over or at least they, the best stuff that they think the AI thinks that they should get. And that's why people become addicted to watching it. That was good. You touched upon a lot of great points though. I mean, that's the most difficult part about being a creative person currently. Like this show has been going on for 13 years. You've been in, in the industry for 30, you know, well, training for 30, but yeah, I understand. Training for yeah, 30, but yeah. Thank you. You've been creating great content for, for a long time. This show has been interviewing people that have create great content for a long time. And the one thing that has been consistent throughout this show and throughout the people I've interviewed is that they're always pushing themselves to not only be better people, but bigger, better creators and promoting themselves any way they can. Better marketer. Too, yeah. That's why I love talking to people like yourself who are driven to constantly create, to constantly better themselves in some way, shape or form using whatever means necessary, social media wise, et cetera, promotion wise. And, and you continuously 
actually do that. Now, inspirational posts on TikTok and work from home aside, though, you've created a lot of other great content in your lifetime. Let's start at the beginning of your life when you started realizing that you had a creative talent. How did that begin? So I'll go back there in a second, but I will say that, that we mentioned work from home. So if you want to find that, uh, it's, it's good to put out into the world at any time. The Jess Kid, my Jess Kid, J-E-S-K-I-D uh, on TikTok, The Jess Kid. His Jess Kid was taken. What? From Jess Kid on Instagram, YouTube, Jess Kid Productions, Jess Kid.com, Jess Kid, uh, The Jess Kid. Uh, I'm like, the real Jess. No, that taken by that other maniac. All right. So you had asked me about my childhood. You know, we're going back. Are we talking about that? Was this therapy now? Is that what we're doing? Not yet, but those are inspirational questions in the second half, okay. but that's beside God, damn it. I was hoping for some free therapy. I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker when I was five, quoted in an article. Uh, my mother was a singer at the time. It was in maybe New York Times or one of those things. It wasn't like a big singer, but said, my brother wants to be a race car driver and I want to be a filmmaker. I wanted to be George Lucas at the time. And I was obsessed with reading about the creation of Star Wars. And uh, I knew there would be nine films back when I was six or five. And I was, I was waiting all these years, very disappointed when they finally came out. I, I felt like uh, from the beginning, that's what I wanted to do. When I was 14, we may or may not have gotten a, a video camera off the back of a truck. And me and my friends started making movies like 14, 15, 16, just bugging out and just being crazy and being silly and being over the top and being offensive, you know? Oh, it surfaced when you were 15, you said a thing. Oh, well, I was 15. So we did all these movies, had fun, but I, I always really wanted to do it. And then I was 18. Uh, I dropped out of high school. I was a mess. The high school was like, a, I went to Bronx Science, which was at the time the best uh, high school in the country. Best, But I didn't have the, it was like Neil deGrasse Tyson, Lisa Sue, CEO of AMD and Just Kid. Dropped out of high school. And I was like, well, what am I going to do? Uh, but I, I kind of dropped out of high school knowing I would go uh, straight to college. I kind of cheated. I, I pulled like one of these Kobayashi Maru moments. And I find out if I took my GED, I don't know how many times I tell the story, that there was a the state universities, which were very hard to get into, would only look at your GED score and not your grades. <laughs> And I knew that if I just got a high enough score in this thing, because I was a good test taker, decently smart guy at the time. But the I took my GED, busted it out, and got into SUNY Albany. Uh, went to school there. Oh, in between, I was working at a Japanese bank while I was applying to college, like a corporate bank, which is now out of business. And I took karate with Japanese people my whole life, so I was very used to the environment. And that was going to be like my career. And I applied to business school. I got into business school. I applied to SUNY Albany. While I was at my desk, I started to write a treatment because uh, I didn't know how to do it. And I was asking advice from my mom's friend. My mom's a writer. Uh, how do I do this? And I was writing a treatment for Terminator 3 at my desk all the time. And then I was making my own newsletter at this Japanese bank. This is the weirdest thing because I couldn't stop being creative and silly, right? And I realized this is not for me. Uh, when I got to SUNY Albany, I took off. It was great. The, the best compliment I think I've ever gotten was from one of the people there. And they had plans for me. So like I was going to become a person... And then eventually, like I said, the company went boom. And in fact, that the company at the time had lent $100 million to Kuroko, which was the company that financed Terminator 2. So when I went to see it, they were like, what do you think of Terminator 2? Is it good? Are we going to make our money back? I'm like, that's yeah, amazing. So it was like kind of like in the business looking at that side. But I left and the guy said to me, he was, thank you for your atmosphere. And I was so thrilled by that because it meant that I made their lives a little happier with my personality or, or just you know trying to bring good vibes to everybody. So I go to Albany. And I'm now I decided I want to be a filmmaker uh, at 18. And then I just started to make movies and I made movie after movie after movie. And you had seen a feature film of mine called Shades of Grey, not the SNF yeah. film, but Shades of Grey is a remake of a 40 minute film I made at SUNY Albany. So there's another version of that, an earlier version that you've never seen. And even though there's a making of that version, I did one semester, but every semester I kept switching genres because my idea was like, I took karate for a long time. I wanted to train. I was training to be a filmmaker. And I was training, I had a great mentor, like a silent film era and 30s and 20s expert. And he was just a really smart guy. And he taught me so much about filmmaking through watching all these old movies. I saw the invention of the first moving shot and my brain was just soaking it in and connecting the dots. And so I made a thriller, I made a sci-fi film, I made a comedy, I made a fantasy film. Every semester, I just switched genres, 30 minute, 40 minute films. And then I got out of school and I was going to apply to grad school. I was like, Dude, this sucks being out of school and I don't know what to do and who do I contact? So I said, well, I'll apply to the best schools in the country because if you get in there, then you're going to be made, you know, because they're connected and they're down. So I applied and I got into two schools. I got into AFI, which is a huge one for editing. And then I got into USC, which would be general directing. But that was like one out of 50 people. And there was all, all these rumors about the USC mafia and you go there, you're set and they're going to hook you up. And I go there and the first day, everybody raised their hand. Where are you guys from? And everybody's like, MIT, Harvard, Yale, Yale, Princeton, Princeton. And they're like, SUNY Albany. And I knew immediately there was a problem like from day one, because this was like a very, very like rich 
you know, group of people. And there's nothing wrong with people who have money, but like, it was just like one of these things is not like the other. I had some good experiences there. Uh, one of them, which is the school was like stuck in the olden times of filmmaking and they had all these old equipment and they didn't want to switch. And then finally they decided to do this digital lab with DV equipment. DV was brand new and I had built my own computers and I was very early and diving in and editing on digital and then converting the film to it. Even though I wasn't allowed to, I did it anyway because I didn't care because I thought it was stupid. They just didn't have the equipment. So I'm like, I'm going to do what I want. I was using DV from like Adobe Premiere 4.2. We're talking about 1996. And I had a $4,000 computer, credit cards already. <laughs> they hired me to be the first student manager ever in the school to build this lab in the Robert Zemeckis Center because they were getting this big grant and then manage it. And I had a staff and my experience at USC was dog shit. It's just, it was what it was. It was horrible. Some nice people, though, are still friends, but some really horrible backbiting climbers, incompetent staff. And like, it was terrible. It was not anything like they said it was. And none of the connections and opportunities that they, they put in all their brochures didn't exist because there were just too many students. Even though I was one of 50, it was like part of like 17 programs. Did the lab, proud of that. So you had a choice. You could either make a film to get out or you could write a screenplay. But to make a film, you had to get involved in some process where it took three years more. And I'm like, I've already, I already owe, and I still owe a ton of money for this. I owe four times what I borrowed. It's insane. So I made a film or a TV series, another story, about student loans called IOU that I was yeah. pitching for TV series. I, I go to school. I hate it. Right. And they're like, we make a film. I'm like, well, I can't. I don't want to. I don't have to get a mentor and then wait all these other years. I've already spent three years. I'm not doing this. So I wrote a feature. I got out. Right. And then the summer I graduated, I shot Shades of Grey, the movie that you saw five years later. But that's when I put it on Rooster Teeth or the, and the other sites. And I made this film and then uh, it was great. And everybody's like, oh my God, it's so funny. It's the best thing ever. It's amazing. It's low budget filmmaking at its best. It's clerks. It's, it's clerks. That's cinematic. And I get out and then I can't get anybody to watch it. Like I'm begging people to watch it. My friend works at a company called Digital Domain, which was James Cameron's effects company. And he gets, he said, we're going to do a screening for you. Right? Great. We're going to do screening. I do the screening. We get, we buy all this like beer and stuff for the back and everybody, he invites everybody in the industry that he knows this and that. And like two lawyers show up, two people in the audience and in the back getting drunk. Cause I'm like, I've finished my movie and nobody will watch it. So it's not going to go anywhere. And then I spent a couple of years, you know, putzing around doing editing jobs for a great company there and, you know, meeting some nice people. But I just realized that this is, this is not going to work. I can't get anybody. And I wrote seven features or something or five, whatever I was with my, one of my teachers, I wrote a couple films which later got option, which is great. But it was just like, I was invisible. And I said, I just came out here. I just spent all this money on grad school. They were full of shit. Everybody's telling me I'm the next Spielberg. Everybody's telling me I'm the next this. And then nothing. I'm like, this sucks. I got to go because I'm going to, I said to myself, I'm going to die out here. The, the social structure of Los Angeles was one of like, you make plans with somebody like you, we scheduled this interview, but you make plans with somebody in LA. It was like, oh no, I, I just was kind of just extending a hand. Like I just met in general. What do you mean, man, general? I thought we were going to hang out. And so I just had trouble making friends there. And I'm a guy that's like, I have like a gazillion friends and I love my friends and I'm like loyal to my friends to a fault. And I love making new friends. I love building community. So for me, this was like the antithesis of this. So I said, I got to get out of here. So I packed up my stuff and I left and I came home broke from 30 years old, went from the next Spielberg to this loser coming home with no money and owing all this money in student loan debt and credit cards. And I, was, I started working again as I worked as a doorman when I was like 18 to 22, uh, which is great because the job was well paid. You know, it's not really my skill level, but who cares? Was, I honored the position by doing the best I could. And every summer I would, I'd buy like three to $5,000 of video equipment by the end of the summer. <laughs> That's what I did every summer. I would just save up, buy all this filmmaking equipment. And then I came home and I'm like broken. A friend of mine who I helped at SUNY Albany, who thought I was like the TA there, I was like the film king there. He was working for an online streaming company called The Feed Room. And which is gone now too. All these companies are gone. That's what happened. And they were doing all stuff. And I, I applied to this job because I was broke. They were like Adobe Premiere Expert to help with their systems. I'm like, I can do that. And then my friend calls me. Go, oh my God, I didn't realize it was you. I can't give you too much, but it's, it's enough for you to get by. So I joined that company and I started doing daily work and they thought I was so great. They eventually hired me, which was awesome. It was enough money for me to get my own apartment because I was living with my mom again, you know, and I got my own place, which is the place I'm in now. You're looking at still for, you know, all these years later. Love this place. Okay, well, I'm stabilized. What do I do? And my friend that we were streaming videos for like Fortune 100 companies every day. We're talking about Dell and like Reuters and we did the first Sweet 16, that thing. So yeah, March Madness, thank you. We did that. It was intense, but incredible. And, I'm, and I became the, my title became the director of encoding. So I was just responsible for like turning one type of video into another and figuring out better ways to do it throughout. Plus doing editing, plus, 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 plus. So I was in digital video all day long. And my friend there had a server I said, well, okay, well, I've got this feature film that nobody's ever seen. 
you know, and everybody loves it. What do I do? So I decided I'm going to break them or re-edit a bit. I'm going to break it into 12 parts. I'm going to put it on the internet in 2003. By the way, I did work for another internet company in 1999, and I was trying to put stuff online then too. So like way, way before. I put Shades of Grey online and I started going from chat room to chat room. Hey, pay attention to me, page. Please, please, please. Begging people. Uh, Shades of Grey dot blah, blah, blah. And they were like, dot, go fuck yourself dot, dot, dot. And they were like nasty. I was like, oh, sorry. But self-promoting, promoting, promoting. While I was working in the feed room, I had time. I was sitting there encoding. So I was like, mm, working the system because nothing existed yet. And then I started doing a, a vlog called Jesky TV. And it's credited by Rooster Teeth and others as being the first vlog. I don't know if it was. I think there were other people out there doing things. It's hard to say first, but it's definitely one of the first and maybe one of the most intricate for that time. So it's the first, like maybe, maybe. I haven't seen this other guy was credited from like 99 or 98. But I helped innovate the, the genre, you know, and that I was very proud of that. And even putting the feature online helped that. It was nothing like it. And so I was doing Jesky TV. It really started to resonate at Rooster Teeth, uh, of all places. Rooster Teeth being Red versus Blue as their main product. And their community just loved it. And I was great. So I started to do Jessica TV and they just ate it up, you know, in a great way. And then they became part of it. And then I was trying to do like a symphony with it, but I didn't really take it seriously in the beginning because it was just me being a clown while I was working on my next thing. And then eventually I did take it very seriously. And I started seeing it as like a new medium. But I hit a point with it where I started to get too personal. I think I had my, um, my family member of mine got very sick. I had cancer. I shot a video on it. And I was posted, I was going to post it. And I made that decision at that moment, I'm exploding myself. It was, and I pulled the plug. And I did that. I've, I've, Jessica TV is still going. Uh, Jessica TV comes back every like two, three years in some form. So it's like probably the longest running vlog. Absolutely. There's nothing close to it, I think. I pulled the plug at that moment because I didn't feel good about it. And then YouTube hit and I made a very big miscalculation. The filmmaker side of me hated YouTube at first. Hated it. Because it was like the compression was so awful. Like I couldn't put my movie up there. Everything looked like pixel vision. Like, why would I, why would I do this? This is garbage. I have my own servers. My stuff looks good. I control it. Even uh, Bernie uh, Rusty says, if you would have continued that path, you'd be the biggest vlogger on YouTube at that time, right? And I just didn't. And that's fine because I obviously didn't want to do that. I was gearing up to make more films. I'm a filmmaker. And I kept saying I'm a filmmaker. So uh, I started to gear up to do Drawn by Pain. And Drawn by Pain is the first movie that I had done in a long time. Because USC, you didn't make a lot of movies. You made some. But this is the first big thing that I wanted to do. Uh, since Shades of Grey. And it was half animated. Uh, and I was like, how am I going to do that? And then I met somebody, uh, Erica Langworthy on uh, Rooster Teeth that did animation. And she uh, loved the idea and moved to New York. And we started working on the project. And it took us three years. And uh, we did very well uh, as far as like acclaim, right? So this is like 2006 to 2009. I put it out there and it was like immediately accepted by everybody. Uh, we had a paid format at first, but then I had to turn that off, which is a, it was a sad moment because I had like, Rooster Teeth sent some traffic to my way, which was great. 26,000 people came to the door. It's like, oh my God, this is incredible. You know, this story drawn by pain, like little girl grows up into, it was actually about my struggles in Los Angeles, right? <laughs> believe it or not. Meaning that like, you know, becoming bitter and not, and fighting against becoming bitter because becoming bitter is the ultimate terrible pill to swallow. You want to be positive if you can. Uh, I started releasing it and then I started promoting it like crazy. I got really good. I hired a $1,500 a month publicist. <laughs> I rented booths at Comic-Con and New York Anime Festival, handed out 10,000 flyers. You know, uh, we won a Webby Award. We got all kinds of press. Critical acclaim was unbelievable. All these sites were approaching us to be on their site. And I said, I'll be on your site. They're like, here's 50% of, you'll get a 50% rev share. I'm like, no, I don't want that. That doesn't, it's not real. You're just promising me something you can't deliver. I want your front page. So if I'll be on your site, I want your front page. And they did it over and over and over. And then we were working with Zero Punctuation, uh, not them, but uh, Escapist Magazine. They were, he's very popular, one and a half million uniques a week. And they were running ads for Drawn by Pain before every episode. So exposure was like, Phew. but again, YouTube was elusive. I, after I missed the boat on YouTube with the vlog, and I knew a lot of people who worked there, it was just crazy, but I just could never get that inside track to where somebody would put you on their front page. Like in the beginning, if you got their front page, you were made, right? Because they had so much exposure, but it was just a who you knew network. But you, you had to know people, right? And that's what really made me very sad. But because like when I was doing Draw My Pain originally, I was saying to Erica, I was like, we have to hurry up. We have to finish this faster. And we were pushing ourselves, like working like two jobs. And it was crazy. We had to keep going because I said, they're coming. Who's like, who's coming? Like, they're going to figure out that this medium is where it's going to be at. They're going to figure it out. And the, the corporations will come in. And they hadn't gotten there yet. It was just a bunch of people. They were going to webisodes and like little like childish names, right? Like, this is the new medium. This is it. 
And then they had the lot, which is the Steven Spielberg run thing where they pick filmmakers and you know, they follow your journey and Project Greenlight. And I'm like, I don't want anything to do with any of that because all that is just an engine to be like, here's a reality show where we make the people on it look bad. Like I'm building a career. Why would I do that? And I was like, you should do it. And I'm like, nah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a dramatic guy. And I would have made an interesting subject for a reality show. But at the same time, it's a career destroyer. I'm not doing that. I built John by Pain. We had all the success, but nothing at YouTube because I didn't have the right connections at YouTube. And so how sad was it that I came from an industry? If you didn't have connections, if you weren't born into it, if you weren't rich, if you weren't a scumbag, now that had moved into the internet. It was, it was devastating. The internet was the democratization of art. It's supposed to be, right? And it wasn't. It became the same shit, became the same sort of like, let me like keep lowering the standard to get in, to get success. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. I just refuse because what I do takes not only time, but a lot of me, part of me, I'm not doing it. Great of talent as well. Yeah. That's the I'm, I'm just not going to be that guy. So I did draw my pain, a lot of success. And I'm like, well, what am I going to do? And then I said, okay, well, I said, well, I got to make another project like to get people's attention. And I had built like people like you, which are very amazing. I was saying before, I have Patreon, if everybody would like Jess Kate on Patreon, where people are just generally supportive of my career. Not like, oh, I get inside information. They just know how hard it's been for me and how many times I've almost gone broke. And, you know, and a lot of people stuck around. I have the same fans of my work and friends for like 15 years. It's amazing. And some for way longer. They believe in what I have to offer. And they see how the system, and there's, I'm sure there's other people like me out there that have been not cheated. I hate that word. The, the, the path was, was stopped. Uh, and there's a lot of people out there that are incredibly talented, I'm sure, that are just, they're, they're, they don't have a clear path. And it's being, sh it's being shouted out by noise or, or just stuff or bad luck or whatever. I don't know. But I, I, I love the fact that if some of them are keeping doing it, that's why I keep doing it. I do it because this is who I am. Right? And I've had successes. Don't get me wrong. You know, I've had v millions of views on this video, millions of views on that. But over the years, I started because of written scripts and I did so much promotion and I did so much uh, editing and shooting and acting and all this stuff, I started to gain a viewpoint of the industry that m maybe five or 10 people in the, in the world have because I've done every step and I've worked with every company, even YouTube. And, and I'm not saying all bad things about YouTube because they've done some great things too, but they've made some missteps when it comes to promoting talent. That's for sure. That's absolute. So getting to about 2008 or nine, I didn't draw my pain. It was like, oh my God, what are you going to do next? Which is great. You know, this is more Jessica TV. I do a series called Status Kill. Yeah. And status kill, uh, it's a professional assassin. So I can, like, when you get, when you do this long enough, you can rattle off descriptions of your thing. So, okay, for those that are listening, Shades of Grey, uh, five friends get together to blackmail their former best friend for all the horrible things he's ever done to them. And throughout the film, you find out all the horrible things he's actually done, which are pretty horrible. And you find out, is he actually sorry? And that's the question of the whole film. Drawn by Pain, it's a... Uh, a young girl uh, draws anime uh, to escape her horrible family situation where her father's beating her and her mother. Uh, and the, when the father kills the, the, the mother, the little girl to defend herself from the dad, her animation comes to life and, and winds up murdering her own father. Fast forward 10 years, the girl's now grown up and we get to find out what kind of mess she's grown up into. And uh, if she doesn't contain her own rage, which she uses as like a superpower, it'll invert and destroy her. So it's a story about self-forgiveness and overcoming struggle. S uh, status kill was a professional assassin um, <laughs> with an addiction to the future version of Facebook or whatever social media platform it is. Uh, can't do his job as an assassin because he's constantly updating his profile. So it's a story uh, about that. So I did status kill, high, high action and question. We did a great job, you know, no money in the middle of the woods with all. One thing I've been really lucky about is that I've done so many projects over the years. I've become very respected by my peers and I love that. Uh, I respect them as well, obviously. And I'm able to get really top talented people to work on my stuff for free a lot, you know, because I mean, the guy who did the graphics for that, plus Erica did some work for that too. And we won a Webby for that, which is the biggest award you can get on the internet. I think my Chris Domino, my friend, he was uh, doing, uh, he was the head of graphics and on air graphics for late night with David Letterman at night or during the day. And at night he was working on status kill doing all the effects, which is amazing. So we just get all these people. Uh, we, we shoot all this series and it's great. And it gets the attention of uh, Rob Barnett at my damn channel. Now, my damn channel was running concurrently to me on the internet in like 2006, 7, 8. And they, Rob was a guy, former uh, MTV executive, high, high executive at CBS, all that stuff. And he started his own internet company. And he was very successful in the beginning They because they were paying top level uh, comedians and other things, content and developing their own. And they did You Suck at Photoshop, which had one of the first hits on the internet, 17 million views on episodes, stuff like that. Wayne Days, which all these comedians, 
And so Rob liked me so much, we hit it off. I became the director of content for Rob. So I moved into sort of like an executive position in a small company. And I had like a team of people working for me. But more importantly, eventually I had 10 teams of filmmakers working for me at all times. Maybe not all times, but a lot of the time where they would report to me and I could actually develop other people's content. And I was really happy about that because I could do for them what was never done for me, which is really just, you know, usher them in and help get them press and just fight for them and with every fiber of my soul because I wanted them to be successful. And it was great because I got to work with like, I got to choose like up and comers. And then I got to work with movie stars like Josh Gad and all those people. So I learned how to sort of develop with them and, and work and give them notes in a way that's non-offensive and non threatening to their artistic integrity, but really help them be like, you know, because I could be like in, fr- in second number six, you need to lose three frames here and then here. It'll improve the moment between this person because what I do for a living is an editor, you know, but I'm also a writer. Uh, and I'm a guy who understands marketing, you know, because I've done all of these roles. And so it's given me a viewpoint that everything I do affects everything else I do. You know, like as a shooter, I shoot for the edit. As a director, I direct for the writer. Or I direct as a uh, writer, I think about the final who's my target audience and how am I going to reach them? So it's very interesting how you, the more knowledge you get, the more that goes up, that vantage point. And every year it's going up more. So I get the job in my damn channel. We create all kinds of stuff. We get seven figure deal from YouTube, uh, content originals, whatever it was called, where they put up hundred million dollars, but then they give all this money and they don't, and they don't promote any of the products that they've given all this money to. So it sits in the same engine. It's crazy. Anyway, like, but that's their decisions. They're like, hey, because they're, 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 that company's always at war with itself. Like, who are they? Are they a vlogger company? Or are they an educational, like, a tutorial company? You know, or are they a high-end content company like YouTube Red, like uh, Cobra Kai? Right? And they, every couple of years, they switch what they want, and they throw a lot of money at it, and then they walk away from it over and over and over. It's really strange. That's what they do when they have a lot of money as a company. They're just like, oh, try that for $100 million. Okay. So we were a recipient of that and we made a lot of great stuff. We did My Name Channel Live, which was way before all these other live things. But my, another thing I did there was I worked with Daily Grace and I structured with her her show because I understood the internet and how to get attention. I just refused to do it for myself. And I know that sounds crazy because if you knew the tools to do it, why wouldn't you do it? Why don't you just get famous? Blah, blah, blah. I just wanted to make quality stuff. I mean, it was a little bit of creative stubbornness, right? I thought I could rise above with just talent. And I'm not saying that she had tremendous talent, but she needed structure. Right. And so for the strand, she was a vlogger. So it was like, okay, well, we're going to do Monday, we're going to do tutorial. Next day, we're going to do, uh, so we did a how to, but we'll do a review. Right. So how to review and an uh, interactive day. And then we did Sexy Friday, where she made anti Sexy Friday in a way, which is amazing that she owned it and took it and ran with it. And all of these are just basically one after the other, you know, algorithm clickbaits. You know, you had to be original within them, but they were designed to get people in the door. Right. So if she does a review on something, well, she get all the traffic from that review thing. We we're talking about 2010 or something. Right. She reached like, I think like a billion views. Crazy. And she part of ways in my damn channel at some point after I left, but I felt great about it. And she credits me for that. And I feel great about that because I could, it's easy to design. It's not hard if you understand people. Right. And the algorithms themselves. And I'm not an algorithm expert, but I have a feel for what will work. So I, I leave my channel on 2012 or 13. And then I do IOU. Because I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? I owe this money to student loans. I owe like 300 grand. It's crazy. I get out and I'm like, oh, well, what am I going to do? I was like, well, this student loans are bullshit and I'm going to make something about this. So I write a whole script, right? I write a script. Uh, I think I got second, second round or something or semifinal, something in the Austin Film Festival, which is a big festival for writers. So I go in there and uh, write a treatment. Uh, and, I, and then I write a show Bible. And the show Bible is like, an, like a diagram of the entire industry, like the entire series, like five seasons. I designed because I want to step back up to the plate. I don't just want to be a guy on the internet being like, hey, it's Tuesday and what the what's going on? And like, like smash that like button. Not me. You know what I mean? It's not what I want to do. I'm not saying I'll never do it, but I'm saying it's not what I want to do. So I want to create great stuff and I want to fill my role and fill my potential as a filmmaker, which I've had for a long time. And if you look at my work, you'll be like, okay, I can see it. Least, I hope you can see it because I've done these things with zero budget sometimes and, and I'm competing with major products with zero. I make uh, what's called bad credit at first, but then we call it IOU, right? And then I ship it around and I, I talk to this one producer and, and I don't know this for a fact. So I'm, this is allegedly, right? Meet this producer and he's a producer with a first look deal over, at, uh, and I won't mention his name, over at uh, the company, Universal Cable Productions, whatever. He's a first look deal there, Connections. And I said, do you want to see my show Bible? I'm looking for a partner to go out with because I've learned a lot from my damn channel about pitching and blah, blah, blah. And he says, Oh, great. I'd love to see it. But send it to him. Two weeks later, he gets it. He says, hey, can I call you? Sure. 
please, this is great. You want to take on the project. Disappears, which is the industry. Everybody goes to you all the time. You don't exist. You don't have power. You're nothing. You're garbage, which is crazy when you're really good at what you do and you're really nice and all these things. And they make you feel like you're nothing. Like you don't exist. It's crazy. Anyway, so I send it. He disappears. Then uh, I get a, I don't know if the order of this. I get a, a first look deal, uh, 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 on paper deal with a company that's going to go out to uh, pitch it. And waiting to pitch it, waiting to pitch it. And right before they're going to pitch it, the, the person who's like championing it leaves and becomes the head of lifetime. I'm, uh, stuck dead. This is common, right? But worse, this is the worst moment. I don't know if it's true, blah, blah, blah. But I look on television and there it is, Mr. Robot. And I call my mom and I'm crying and I'm like, I'm destroyed. I see the preview for this. I'm like, that's my show. From the same company, this guy had a first look deal. at. Different than my show. Obviously, they went to a totally different direction and uh, who knows? And, I, I, and to this day, I always wonder, did they or did they not? And then I look and inside my show Bible, there's a character, the father character who plays a central role. Uh, was a failed guy who used to run an arcade and thought it was going to be big, kind of like Blockbuster, <laughs> and has all his video games in storage, and they, they do some planning out of the storage. And then I watch the show, and I see that their main meeting place is in a, a Coney Island arcade. Right. So at that moment, I'm like, that's specific. Uh, and you have my material. So either my belief is either you, uh, one of three things, you got my material. The reason he wanted to call me was, it was, it was so similar to the thing they had already had in development, you know, that they couldn't entertain it. Okay. Uh, B, outright stole. C, somebody on the team, maybe not even the creator, cherry picked. Said, this, this is good. This is good. This is good. And in an interview with the main guy, they, they asked him, I listened to it. Uh, and I'm not saying anything disrespectful to him because I don't know him. Even if I reached out to him, they would never comment because it's litigious. Right. And I said to him, like, I mean, I listened to an interview and they, some interviews, it goes great. And, you know, and he goes, well, it was a story about hackers. He wrote and about that fly, apparently story about hackers. And, uh, what, you know, and the guy said, well, what about all this student loan stuff and all this financial stuff that came in? He goes, well, that came into the story much later. So my brain says, well, at what point did it come? In? Cause that's what my entire thing was. And if you look at my uh, uh, video for IOU online, you'll see it, IOU. Watch that. Let's see. Anyway, so that was just tremendously like, hey, Jess, uh, even when you make something great, you're, you're, this is what happens. And that's an Emmy-winning show. And maybe there was nothing. Maybe they took nothing. And maybe the whole thing was original. I'll never know unless somebody from their team hears this and, and reaches out. Because if I reach out to them, they're not going to answer. You know what I mean? It's incriminating. Or it's just, like I said, it just could have been cherry-picked from a, an executive that said, oh, you should add this. Anyway, so I go back to doing Jessica TV, and I'm like in my living room, and I'm like, okay. And this is a story maybe you don't know. I don't know. I've known you for a while, but to understand your journey and hearing your journey the way you're, you're, you're telling it, I mean, it, I mean, everyone that's creative goes through struggles, but you seem to be going through a hell of a lot, and you still manage to come out on top with your own style with your own process with yourself as, as a person and, and as a director you're very kind i mean i feel like it's not that i come out on top i just refuse to be on the bottom the, my point is that i just don't i don't quit you're not gonna stop me fuck you like how dare you it takes sometimes i get blown out like that blew me out year i'll disappear you'll see me just disappear for a while something happened and there's things i can't even talk about that happened for people that i care about we're gonna talk about horrible horrible and the epicenter, I mean, I, they call me like, the, I'm the force gump of the internet. And there's stories I can't even tell you, things I've been involved in that I've changed the entire scope of like political elections and other things. It's crazy. But anyway, this one I will tell you. So I start doing Jessica TV again. And then I make this video and they start doing well, 2015. Start doing really well. Facebook, especially, you know, video, million views, I'm, but I'm having to pay them to reach people. That's a whole nother thing about the algorithm. Once you get people to opt in on Facebook and Instagram, they like your stuff. They're like, now, okay, now pay me to reach the people that you're now giving us free content to reach. Yeah. So I have to make the content, pay for the time and the energy to do it. And then you want me to pay you to reach the people with it? And you're using it to make advertising dollars? Fuck you. Fucking Facebook bullshit. These people are full of shit. And that's, you can see a direct way they're harming creators. And only the top, 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 top creators get it. 
and only the people that find a way to game the system get there. It's, it's insane. Anyway, so that's why TikTok I like more currently. So I'm doing these videos. They're starting to do well, though. Every video is getting like 300 shares, 500 shares. And then the, the other one had like 10,000 likes or something crazy to stop calling me a white guy thing, um, which I found out somebody had done that joke earlier, by the way. Um, I didn't know about their joke. Uh, but so I actually emailed that person and congratulated them on having getting there first and acknowledging the fact that they were similar because that was the right thing to do. Yeah. And I, I agonized over what I would say to this person, you know, because there's no first. It's just like, it's a, it's a misconception. There's just ideas out there. But I wanted to make sure that it was clear that I respected him and what he had done. So, because it wasn't done for me when it was taken for me. So I do this thing called uh, Rest in Peace Alpha Male. It's a Jessica TV. You can look it up. And uh, it's great. It's really, it's about the election. It's about, you know, it's a, the bully nature of specifically Trump, but like, I don't want to offend anybody out there. I'm not anti-conservative. I'm anti-scumbag. You know what I'm saying? And that, those scumbags can come from somebody on the, people on the extreme left too. Don't get me wrong with cancel culture, all this stuff. I don't agree with that either. So I'm somewhere in the middle. I don't know. I don't know what I am. But point is, in this video about that, that old school 50s mentality of bullying people about everything is wrong. And it is. And what I use is I use very specific movies to intercut with. We're talking weird science and like all these movies, yeah. Karate Kid, before there was a series again, and all these specific movies. Anyway, I'm watching TV one day or something on the internet, and this commercial comes on. I'm like, oh, it's my video. What the hell? But it's not my video. Hillary Clinton's number one commercial, shot for shot copy yes. of my Jessica TV episode, shot for shot. And we're not, I'm an editor, not one in a million, not one in a trillion, one in a gazillion. And uh, they use the exact same movies, almost the same clips. And what they did was they just removed me, obviously, and they made it more about Trump, and they just cut from clip to clip to clip of Trump's a bully. But they still took the same clips, same weird science, same everything, even ape the music. And that was her uh, big convention thing. And if you look now, you can look up sl on slate.com or whatever, or look up Hillary Clinton bullies video, and then look up rest in peace, Alpha Male, and you'll throw up. And so I said, my God, they're stealing from me even out of my living room. Like, this is insane. This has happened twice in the last two years. It's insane. So, and then I said, it was a well, if I'm not good and to be stolen from for Emmy winning shows, potentially, allegedly, don't know. And Hillary, but Hillary Clinton, for sure, their team, don't know who did it. I'm not sure Hillary was looking at my video like, yeah, let's do that. You know, I don't know. There were hypocrites on all sides of the aisle. And I didn't, I didn't go hard at them because at that moment, Melania Trump had just stolen the speech, plagiarized yeah. the speech of somebody, uh, what's her name? Barack Obama, uh, Michelle Obama. Yeah. And if I came out with that, they would have used that. Oh, look, they steal too. And I didn't want that guy to win because I think he's not a good person. So I go from that and I'm like, I'm just blown out. And I stopped Jessica TV for a while. I'm just tired. I'm tired. I don't know how else to put it. I'm tired. I'm broke. I'm, you know, I'm putting everything into everybody I can. And like, it's really tough. And uh, so I gear back up and I make, I say, I'm going to do one more thing. And then I uh, did the Jessica TV pilot uh, in the middle of it. My father passes away, which was really hard because I was constantly being called to the hospital. It was a really, really tough situation. My brain broke. 2019. Broke. There was just nothing left, dude. We're talking about 25 years of like Jessica TV, this and that, and never really uh, hitting that point of saturation online or in the industry. Still not having an agent or a manager. Like, this is insane. I have a 22 pages of a textbook written about me that was in US, and it was ironically, the guy passed away, but it was USC's head of editing, head of editing track at USC. Love Drawn by Pain so much, didn't even know me from USC. You know, put a chapter that goes to every student that went in through his class and through his school in his editing program, talking about my web work. You know, I've got webbies, I've got millions of views, I've got uh, all this different press acclaim. No agent, no manager, no deal. You know, and then still being stolen from. And so I think that 2000, like, maybe 19 or 18, my brain just broke. I just had enough. I had enough of the games and the bullshit. And I just retreated. And uh, I started streaming on Twitch, video games, Overwatch obsessively being nice to a bunch of scumbags in a video game. Many of them were, no offense. Six p players that can't get along and I get them to, to team up by the end of it. And I'm like exhausted emotionally doing it. But I was building something because I was Forrest Gumping. I was just running. I didn't know what else to do. At least I, I didn't stop. I just started streaming. Like, what are you doing? He's streaming. Okay. And I saw the future in this, this live thing. I loved it. I got all this equipment. I have three camera set up. Did the Just Kidding podcast. Did 22 episodes of that. And then I started to Just Kid Film School online where I break down films using my editorial perspective. And then I was working for a company for a while called uh, Husay, which became, got bought by Viacom, which is influencer marketing. 
they're big. I mean, they work with all these celebrities. And so I could add my skill set to them. So every couple of years, I make a lot of money doing like, and then I make no money. That's kind of my life. Like doing like editing or shooting or directing. I directed LL Cool J uh, and those people at their at a conference that they held. And that was amazing because I got to sit with like Fortune 100 CMOs and listen to them for eight hours a day, talk about the industry with celebrities interviewing them. And so those things are great, but that's because I've made a lot of great contacts and all great friends online and they respect what I do. And they know when, I, when they hire me, I'm going to bring it. I'm going to make their things incredible and I'm going to be worth whatever they pay me because I have not only a vantage point, but a skill set that's massive and builds over 30 years and, and encompasses everything. To this day, that's really helped me. And then I, while I was streaming, that kind of the game that I was playing started to die and I just got tired again. And I'm doing work and I helped change some political stuff. I can't even talk about some of the stuff I did. And then I was like, okay, what am I going to do? The pandemic hit and I'm home and sometimes I have no money. Sometimes I have good money. It's all over the place. And what am I going to do? Uh, well, okay. And a friend of mine on Twitch uh, was like, oh, I've been doing this TikTok to bring people into Twitch. Like, is that a good idea? Like, isn't TikTok for like 12-year-olds and dancing girls? Like, I don't really understand. And I started watching it and I said, well, wait a minute. This, the artists are here. It's like Cheech and Chong is on TikTok. Like, I'm not saying Cheech and Chong are artists, but like, you know what I mean? Like, there's like all age ranges on this thing. There's something here that's different. And as an editor and a filmmaker that's produced films uh, ranging from hour and a half to 30 seconds to 10 seconds, I understand structure and film writing structure. So I said, well, what can I do for TikTok? And I said, I need to uh, come up with a structure, a format that's repeatable, that works, an interesting idea, an IP. I love the idea of taking IP, intellectual property, and growing it out from 30 second bites into a TV show or a film. So maybe I can make this work from home series and IP. And if it works, it'll grow out and we'll see where it goes. If it gets bigger, maybe it's a show. Maybe, as people have said, it's the 21st century version of The Office, you know, which I'm fascinated by. And I'm telling it in bite moments. But I have to design each episode to both reach a new viewer and an existing viewer. And that's incredibly hard, especially the new viewer part. And in four seconds, you have to communicate. But this is understanding web structure. So it's exciting again. And for the first time, I felt like, like wind in my sails your reason to get up in the morning again. It's depressing some of this stuff because I've worked so hard and I love what I do and I love the people that I meet and I love building community. I love it. And I feel like barring any sort of cancel culture moment in my life, and I'm terrified of that because I've said all kinds of crazy shit. You know what I'm saying? And I've apologized, but not necessarily apologized. I've expressed understanding of the moments in time. I'm always trying to progress and evolve as a person. And I change with culture. But I got a big fucking mouth. <laughs> and I make a lot of jokes. And if you, if you listen to me and you understand my intent behind everything I do, I have a heart of gold and I love all people and I believe all people are equal and I can't wait to be with them and, and help them and have them be a part of my life and my community as well. With that said... I have a wild sense of humor and I play with stereotypes and shades of gray and other movies. I play with them to expose them as bullshit. But if you're in it for the soundbite, you could look at somebody like me and soundbite me and say, look, he's a terrible person. What are you talking about? I fought for people my whole life. Artists should be scared of cancel culture. They should be. Anything that restricts self-expression is bad. I understand there's a limit in terms of service. If you're, what you're actually communicating is actually hurting people, hurting them. I understand. Get rid of it. I get it. If, if you're anti-medicine like medicine in a way that's hurting people, people are dying from what you're doing, okay, I can understand. But people making jokes 20 years ago, 10 years ago, two months ago, whatever, I don't understand. Because is, is the context is within a joke in a form of self-expression? Or is the context that they were using it to belittle people so that they could harm them? The second one, I understand. That's what they, they what comedy was used in very nefarious ways. The first one, I, I don't, I think it restricts self. So, so I'm at the point where I feel like I'm ready to move forward and bring people together and keep my body in shape because I'm getting a little older than I was, but go for it. I'm ready to fucking go for it. And I'm, I'm excited because I feel like I'm reaching people again for the first time in a while. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? My mother. My mother's a writer. I watch my mother get up at six o'clock in the morning. Every morning uh, before we go to school, I would go out to where she was when I would wake up and she'd be writing. She'd write and then she'd go to work. Then she'd take care of us and then she'd write into the night. 
My mother's, you know, five time published novelist. I've seen her struggle through everything and I've seen her never give up and I've seen her overcome things over and over and over. Strongest, nicest, best person I've ever met. My mother, hands down. It's the most inspirational person, Stephanie Cowell. And if you could read her book, Claude and Camille, you'll understand what it is to be an artist. It's amazing. She's a brilliant lady. And not just because she's my mom, but because she's incredible. From a professional standpoint, obviously, you've been doing this for a long time. You've had a great career for many decades. You've had a lot of success in your life that you've spoken about. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, million percent. Yeah, I have goals that I want to achieve, right? When you're around long enough and you see other people achieve those particular goals, you start to realize there's no gold at the end of that rainbow. It's just a different experience, right? And as long as you can pay your bills and you're doing your thing, who cares? Does it really matter if I reach 10,000 people and somebody else reached 100,000? Like, is their life better because they had a bigger reach? You know, I can look in the mirror and be proud of myself. I can say I gave it my all. I don't control the systems of which I navigate. I can only control what I do. Uh, and what I do, I'm exceptionally proud of the fact that I keep going and I'm very proud of the people that I've met. I know it sounds crazy, but that's really what life is. Life is just experiences in the end. Like if I was to ask you like, who's the Oscar winner for best picture in 1978? Off the top of your head, you have no idea, right? And that's the top of the top of the top. You have no idea. So does it really matter, you know, if you had that moment or not, you know, because life is a million moments. So am I successful? Dude, show me somebody else that's done it like I've done it. You know, and I'm not saying that, oh, I'm the best, but I'm certainly a story of perseverance, a desire to express my talent, my small talents or my large talent, depending on your perspective. Am I successful? Yeah. I'd rather be this than the guy who, when I went to USC, got out at 26 and made like a big feature film and then flamed out and made a bunch of garbage for many years that I'm not proud of just to pay the bills. I got to do it my way for a long time. So even if I do it somebody else's way, which I'm more than happy to do, great, amazing. I get to collaborate with new people. But I had my time to do it my way and I'm still doing it. It's awesome. So I'm, yes, am I successful? I am the, and maybe not in the financial sense sometimes, but I am the, epit the epitome of success, putting creative work into the world. Yes. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? I mean, it's like me and failure is like a best friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's like, so what is the definition of failure then, right? How do you deal with your failure? What's a failure? I mean, I have to, I can't pose it to you. I guess I have to pose it to myself. What is, what you have to, my definition of failure has changed over the years. My definition of failure was like, oh, I didn't sell the TV show. I'm a failure. That doesn't make any sense. A failure is somebody who doesn't try. A failure doesn't somebody who doesn't put effort into the world. That's a failure. A failure is somebody who, when anything gets tough, they just don't do it at all. That's a failure. A failure is not somebody who takes it to the bitter end and does everything they can. That's a, a very successful person. But you have to understand the, the climate and the currents that you're navigating to define what that role of failure is. I used to think I didn't make it to X, I'm a failure. But if X is, is, makes no sense, then there's no failing in it. There's either you know, stumbling through to success or stumbling through to what you perceive as failure. So uh, when do I fail? I fail only when I make mistakes that I don't find ways to correct. That's a failure for me. I fail as if I'm not growing as a person. That's a failure for me. I don't look at some of the things that I've done in the past, even some of the things that I've said, and I'm not like making myself to be a monster. I'm just a, a silly, slightly offensive guy sometimes because I, I, I think it's funny, but I'm a failure if I don't try to learn from even my own moments. That's a failure to me, but I don't really do that. I'm constantly analyzing and trying to better myself. So uh, I find myself very successful in that way. So what's failure? I don't, I don't, I don't like failure is just not doing. Failure is not trying, not trying to evolve as a person, as an artist, as anything. That's failure. And I'm not guilty of that at all. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's creating their own shows, creating their own TikTok videos or whatever they'd like to create as the creative people that they can be. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I've mentored a lot of people over the years. And I'm proud of that. Because I always want to do unto others, which I wish was done unto me. I've mentioned that before, not in the religious sense, but just in the, the life sense. Just do your best. Don't cheap out. Pick other people up. Offer unselfishly too. Understand when somebody's taking advantage of you and walk away. But other than that, offer unselfishly. 
And that's how you can help other people. How can you inspire them? Um, be your best authentic self. And I know that sounds cliche, but just be strip away all the layers that you have that are blocking you from the world and be you. People can relate to truth. Put your truth into the world, you know, and, and work hard at it. And other people will feel that truth. I've had a lot of people uh, grow up to be filmmakers and artists and because watching Jessica TV. So I feel like happy about that as long as they were happy. And as long as they understood the, the pitfalls and the, and the hurdles that were in that journey. Because it comes at a price. It's not, I want to inspire people, but I also want them to understand the reality of the landscape that surrounds them. And I, I've taught classes. I've taught classes, you know, graduate level classes. And I help out with other classes. And I'm always just trying to make them feel good about what they're doing the world is always telling them the opposite, you know, and say, not just you can do it. That's, that's a bullshit blanket statement, but saying you can achieve things by putting your best self into the world. And I don't know exactly what those things you will achieve are, you know, and they may shift on you. They may not be what you think they were, but you can achieve things by putting things in the world and by being a good person. I want to inspire people to be better people. You know, because I want to inspire myself to be that too. Like other people do that for me. I have a lot of things that have inspired me to be the best that I can be. And I'm not done. My journey's not done. I'm constantly being inspired. Like I'm not a set entity, you know? So what can I do for them? I can just say, just go be awesome. And don't just be like, oh, I'm awesome. That's just a proclamation of being awesome. Go be awesome. And other people will be inspired by you trying to be awesome, despite any hurdles. Well, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You know, it just it's been a pleasure having you on, man. It, we are definitely going to have to have another show. There is so much more I want to dive into about your creative sure. journey, about your life as well, too. Happy to help. Uh, but before I let you go, where can we find you on social media and how can we help support and promote you? Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. And I think that, like, by the way, I feel like I was going to make the joke of this. It's just been one geek talking, so forgive me. But, <laughs> you know, over the years when you tell these stories... Yeah, like the, the refinement of the telling comes into play. And I kind of know where I knew where, you, where you're going to guide. You know what I mean? You want to know the story. So that, that is the story. So forgive me for taking up so much of your time. Um, where can people find me? Uh, Jess Kid on YouTube. Jess Kid on, I believe Jess Kid on YouTube. Jess Kid on, one S and Jess, by the way. Uh, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook is Jess Kid TV. Uh, TikTok, very interesting. The Jess Kid, sad face. And JessKid.com. On Patreon, I'm also Jess Kid. If you wish to donate or contribute a little bit to my monthly journey, uh, I will not disappoint you. I will always come out swinging and make stuff that you enjoy. That's who I am. That's what I do. You have to promote yourself. You have to promote your journey. And I'm glad you stopped by uh, on the show to do that. My and pleasure. Again, thank you so much. My pleasure. Hey, really quick note. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. I told a lot of the great advice I'm going to give to you and to everybody else. But I gave it to myself. It's that you're not selling yourself. Well, you, you feel like you're selling yourself, right? When you do these things, it feels cheap. Nobody likes to sell themselves, especially if you're an artist. All you need to do instead of the word promote or sell is switch that word to share in your brain. So from now on, right, you're not promoting yourself. You're not selling yourself. You're just sharing what you do. Just share. And it's a lot more organic and natural. Oh, no, you don't have to. <laughs> please, please, please. I like I appreciate you, dude. I appreciate you having me on. For anybody that's listening, I always hope I don't come across as like, any type of victim because I'm all about doing, you know, but these are just the, the facts of my life. Uh, as I said, that ends this particular episode of two gigs talking again. Thanks so much Jess, for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Um, you know, check out his work, check out and support him any way you can. And as I say, every week, everyone has a story to tell and it's up to me to help bring that out. And thanks for listening and watching on two gigs talking.